We hope this message from Word of Life Church and Pastor Brian Zahn is a blessing to you. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm continuing to preach on the crucified God. We've moved on to Friday nights as well as Sunday in this series because I've just got more than I can say, it seems, in, in just the Sundays. I think this is now part seven in this series, The Crucified God. And my message tonight is entitled, The Failure of Jesus. Yeah. That's what I want to preach on tonight, the failure of Jesus. Now, is my sermon title, The Failure of Jesus, is, is it a bit provocative? Perhaps. But there's a sense in which it is also deeply true. Jesus did experience failure. We are not conditioned to think that way. We think of Jesus as eminently successful. The one who succeeds in everything he does. Kind of a Midas, kind of a... You know, that sort of thing. Everything he does, he succeeds in. And there are reasons why we have come upon that way of thinking, but I think it's deeply misleading. Jesus died an apparent failure in the eyes of, well, everyone. Let that sink in. When Jesus came to the end of his life, he would be in one way or another accounted as having failed in his mission in the eyes of everyone. Maybe you know of somebody, maybe you can come up and tell me after service, I doubt it, but I don't think there is anyone who thought that Jesus was, was succeeding in what he was doing as he hung up on the cross, with the one exception of the thief that is crucified with him and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Yes, I know that Easter changed all of that, this perception that Jesus is failing. I get that. I totally understand that Easter changed all of that, but slow down. Slow down. Just slow down. You can't rush. You can't just rush to Easter. We, we want to rush from Christmas to Easter. We want Merry Christmas, Happy Easter. This is Christianity. This is not Christianity. Our elders... It many, many, many centuries ago had this intuitive wisdom that as we approach Easter, we have to put on the brakes. Lent is a way of putting on the brakes. Because what we want to do is we just want to rush to Easter. We want to get Jesus up out of the tomb and alive and, you know, King of kings and Lord of lords and rock on. That's what we want to do. But our elders had some wisdom and they said, we've got to put on the brakes. And we're going to take 40 days and slow down as we approach Easter. Jesus did what he did, not by achieving success, but by dying as a failure. Again, that could be regarded as a provocative statement, but I'll stand by it. Jesus did what he did, the reason that we worship him tonight, that which is central to all of his life and message. He did what he did, not by success, a very elusive word, a very... Uh, Contemporary word, a word that we are much infatuated by, but a word that doesn't even make a single appearance in the New Testament. Jesus did what he did, not by achieving success, but by dying as a failure. Success is an idol. And it is a particularly American idol. We are infatuated deeply with success, and it leads us astray. Faithfulness, which is what we're called to in not success, often looks like failure, at least until Easter. I want to say that again. Faithfulness often looks like failure, at least until Easter. What happens on Easter is that Good Friday is seen in a new light. 
Easter makes us go back to Good Friday and reevaluate what we saw and what we thought. But Easter does not erase Good Friday. Easter doesn't mean Good Friday never happened. Easter doesn't mean that Good Friday wasn't there. Easter doesn't mean that Good Friday was not experienced in real time by Jesus of Nazareth, because it was. If we use Easter to obliterate Good Friday rather than illuminate Good Friday, we end up with a theology of success, a very American idol. And if we do this, we miss the much deeper theology of the crucified God, wherein lies the deepest truths of the Christian faith. So let's slow down and let's look at it Maybe I could tell the story like this. You see, there was this guy. And he was a peasant. A poet preacher. And around the age of 30, pretty young I know, but around the age of 30, he began to preach and to announce that the reign and rule of God was now coming among men. And that God's kingdom was a kingdom of love and peace. And this young poet, preacher, peasant began to preach these things. He also had a gift for working miracles, especially the healing of the sick. And this caused him to begin to amass a great following, especially in the rural areas among other peasant people. He told provocative stories, he healed the sick, he set people free from their demons, and he announced that God was breaking into the world with a new way of arranging the world, a new kind of government, a government of love and peace. And over about a year, maybe a year and a half or so, maybe even two years, this movement around this guy became very big. Thousands, maybe tens of thousands of followers. But then this guy began to say some things that were regarded as rather controversial. And his popularity began to ebb. And on one occasion when he said some things that were especially controversial, he lost most of his followers. Some of the hardcore ones stuck it out. But the big popular movement that he'd had in his glory days was lost. Officials, both religious and civil, were increasingly concerned about what this guy was saying. And so he was placed under a lot of scrutiny, a lot of surveillance. They were keeping tabs on him. Finally, this guy comes to the capital. He comes to the capital city. And that's when his followers try to rally support. And so as he comes into the city... His hardcore loyal followers from the rural districts begin to shout and they have this kind of parade and they announce him as the king that's coming and this is some great thing and they get all excited about it. But within a week, the capital had turned against him. He was arrested and after his arrest, his remaining followers deserted him. He was convicted in a religious court of heresy and blasphemy. And he was convicted in criminal court of treason and was sentenced to execution. At his execution, out of all of his followers, and at one point there had been, I don't know, maybe upwards of 10,000... 
at his execution, out of all of those thousands of followers, the only one who showed up to show some support, the only ones there were one disciple. His mom and a handful of women, most of who were relatives. That's it. Among his last words were these. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was 33. That's a true telling of the Jesus story from Capernaum to Calvary. As we evaluate the life of Jesus at sundown on Good Friday, what do we find? A promising life that apparently attempted too much and in the end died a failure. When Jesus is dead and buried... What did he leave behind? Nothing much to speak of. He never wrote anything, so there's no hope of later on his writings will be found and people will recognize, oh my gosh, he was a genius. And we just didn't recognize it. He didn't, that's not going to happen because he didn't write anything. The movement he had started and for a while had been so popular and so promising has fizzled out. One of his closest, one of his closest disciples betrayed him, and his chief disciple denied him in the crucial moment. The few who did stick with him are completely disillusioned and disheartened. This is how it is when Jesus dies. I want you to feel it. I want you to, I want there to be agony. I want you to be, oh. We need to seriously grapple with what it means that Jesus died as a failure. Again, I know we'll get to that thing that happens. But as he dies, that is the universal, at least among human beings, evaluation of what this life has accomplished. And apparently it's somewhat close to what this crucified man is feeling. My God, my God, why have you given up on me? Remember, Jesus is living this real time, and this is not a passion play. Jesus, yes, Jesus believes in the sense that he believes that he's going to be raised on the third day. He has spoken that. He has said that. Yes. But it isn't something he knows, knows. It's not something that has already happened and he's looking back on. It's, it's looking forward that he doesn't see that, but he believes that. In other words, Jesus is not playing the role of Jesus in a passion play. Where he's going to act like he's being crucified and then they're going to take him down and they're going to put him in, 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 the, in the tomb and then he's going to run out the back and put on a different robe and come out and ta-da! I mean, he's living this real time and, and he doesn't know in the sense of an empirical knowledge what happens when he dies. Where this thing goes. When Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is the opening line of Psalm 22. It's not because God had forsaken Jesus. God had not. God had not forsaken Jesus. And if you read the whole of the psalm, that's apparent enough. But, because this is what Jesus fully experienced in the dereliction of the cross, he gives voice to it because it's what he is experiencing. It's what he is feeling. God has never forsaken you. 
but I'm willing to bet a dime there have been times when you sure felt like it. All right, Jesus is no stranger to that feeling to the hundredth power. I mean, there he is. It's one thing to anticipate how things are going to play out. It's another thing to have to walk through it and live it. And so here are these disciples, which is kind of a... You're giving them the benefit of the doubt by calling them that in this moment. Because they're conspicuous in their absence. Jesus has given his life to announcing this other way, this new way that God is bringing a new kingdom, a new reign, a new rule, a new government, a new politics, a new policy into the earth. And he has taught it with sermon and parable. He's enacted it with miracle and table practice. He's modeled it to disciples, the 12, the 70, the multitudes. But either they didn't get it, or they rejected it, or they gave up on it, or they just couldn't do it. Because Jesus arrives at the end of his life empty-handed. With nothing to show for it. Can you feel, does anybody feel that? It's like, he arrives at the end of his life empty-handed. What does he have to show for what he's been doing? What he has to show is whatever he accomplished as a carpenter. Oh yeah, well I built some stuff. See my chair? As far as that whole ministry thing, that hadn't worked out very well. So what does Jesus do at the very end? At the end of an apparently failed life. He does the only thing he can do. He puts it all in God's hands. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's in your hands now, Father. And he breathes his last. It is the resignation into trust. Jesus dies with the resignation of trust. I mean, he breathes, the, the scriptures pull that out. He breathes his last. There's this, it's a deep sigh of resignation unto death, but in trust. As if to say, it's all in your hands now. Then, well, not then. Tick, 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 tick. It's late Friday afternoon, it's Friday night. It's all day, Saturday morning, afternoon, evening, night. Then. Then, Easter happened. And Jesus is raised from the dead. As Lord. And now everything that he had taught and modeled, preached, proclaimed, given prayer, all of it suddenly back in play. It's not over yet. We thought it was over. Turns out it's just beginning. I mean, what was the end? And it was an end. It is finished. It's suddenly now just the new beginning of everything. But it doesn't begin until the grain falls into the ground and it dies. And it dies a bitter death. Feeling like a failure. 
So out of the soul-crushing despair of Good Friday, when even the sun fails to shine. I read that this week in our reading in Luke. I just It says, and the sun fails failed to shine. Everything's failing on this day. Everything is one massive stinking failure. Even the sun is failing to shine. Out of the soul crushing despair of Good Friday when even the sun fails to shine we step into the heating light of Easter Sunday and the beauty of all things made new. Easter and Easter alone That is the resurrection, and the resurrection alone makes Good Friday good. The beginning of new creation. Because nobody else on Good Friday is going, he's doing a real good job. You know there was lots of second guessing. He should have been smarter about this. Should have slowed down. Shouldn't have been so controversial. He shouldn't have gone so fast. He shouldn't have attempted so much. He should have had more realistic ambitions. You know, you can, you can imagine this, the Monday morning quarterbacks. But Easter changes all of that. Now we see that Friday. We see that Black Friday as Good Friday. We see that Failed Friday as Good Friday but, we, but it's only because of Easter, the resurrection. We know this from the vantage point of being Christian believers. We know this. I mean, this, this, is, our, this is our story. This is the heart of our story. Death, burial, resurrection. That's at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. But, be honest now. Think deeply. Don't you also already know that? A little bit? From your own experience? At least some of us? Maybe some that are older? Maybe? What I mean is how many of us can look back upon a certain failure or some kind of death in our life And now realize that we became different and better people for having gone through that. See? We look back and we think, wait a minute, wait a minute. The thing that really saved me, the thing that really kept me from becoming a complete jerk, wasn't being successful. It was that massive failure, that death, that that awful thing I had to go through, that, I needed that. And anybody relate to any of that? It's what Jesus calls the sign of Jonah. And it's the only sign that really matters, that's what Jesus said. He says, I know y'all people just crazy for signs, want me to do a sign, pull the rabbit out of the hat. Turn the water to wine. Walk on the water. You know. Raise somebody from the dead that's been dead five days. Maybe six. Can you go for seven, Jesus? Show us a sign. And Jesus said, there's only one sign that matters, and that's the sign of the prophet Jonah, who was in the belly of the whale, but he came back. And he came back different. Jesus says there's only one sign that matters, and it's the sign of Jonah. It's out of failure, out of defeat, out of death that God raises us to newness of life. The pattern of death, burial, resurrection. That is, loss, failure, it all falls apart, give up on it. It's a lost cause now. And then suddenly everything is turned around. That is the recurring plot theme of the Bible, in one sense, it's like it's the only theme in the Bible. You ever watch these, maybe a dramatic series on TV, and you get into these dramatic series, and after watching about 10 episodes, you realize they got the same plot theme every episode. The Bible's kind of that way. 
It's death, burial, and resurrection over and over and over and over again trying to drum it into our heads. I mean, look at all the biggies. Here's Abraham. He's going to be an important guy. Though he's got, he's, what is his calling? To be the father of a multitude and the father of faith. And he can't even get his wife pregnant. And I mean, that goes on for like 20-some years. Where he's childless. I mean, I mean, there's a cruel irony there. You know, you're supposed to be the father of nations. And you're childless. I mean, they all have to go through these things. I mean, wh- what Jacob, I mean, the guy, you, n- nobody likes Jacob. Are you kidding me? That scoundrel, that cheat, that con man, that arrogant, no good, blankety blank. Until he goes to jab book, and it's a kind of death, and he gets his brains beat out by an angel and thinks he's dying. Dislocates his hip. Angel has him in a headlock. I mean, I'm elaborating upon this little midrash here, but he had a, he, do you understand that Jacob has to have jab book? He has to have that wrestling with the angel. He has to have the angel pin him down. He has to have that. Amen. Joseph. He's got he's to be a slave for a while. He's got to be betrayed by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold to Midianite slave traders, end up in Egypt, look like it's going to be okay there, and then gets thrown in prison. And He's got to go through that. Amen. He can't just be 17 years old, and I had a dream, I'm going to be a really big success, and then it happened, and he can be, him be anything but a jerk. He's got to go through that. Moses, he's got to spend 40 years as a failure in the wilderness. And I tell you, the 40 years that he's in the wilderness working for his father-in-law, he's not thinking, any day now I'm going to have my comeback. I mean, that's, it was just gone. He'd given up on that. David, read his Psalms. It's all this thing about how it's all lost and he's down in the pit and it's... Elijah has his despair where he's curled up in a fetal position under a desert shrub praying to die. This is the mighty prophet. Jonah, the belly of the whale. Peter, who gets the keys to the kingdom, throws them away saying, I don't even know the guy. Saul of Tarsus has to have this death experience at Damascus where everything he was so sure about crumbles like a house of cards. They're all following the same plot narrative as Jesus. Death, burial, resurrection. Yet we still try to be the exception. Can I get a witness? And so we make the Bible about success. I I cannot tell you how many sermons I've heard, yay, preached, good bunch of them myself, that are, you know, along the line of the Bible teaching you how to be a success, even though the word success doesn't ever occur even in the New Testament once. Success is the great American idol. Now, what is success in the American Idol sense of the word? What is success? Success is when we complete the project of, our make, of making our lives the way we want them to be. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? What is success? Success is when we complete the project of making our lives the way we want them to be. And what do we want our lives to be before the sign of Jonah has had its work in us? Well, we, we, we only want, we only want what we're told to want. We think, we think, we think we're expressing some deep inner longing, but we're only, we only want what we've been scripted to want. We don't even know what to want. We think it comes from within. It doesn't come from within. It comes from without. It comes from the script handed to us. We think success is when we complete the project of making our life the way we want it to be. And what do we want to be? Well, we want to be rich. We want to be a winner. We want to be powerful. 
and we want to be popular. That covers 98% of it. There'll be 2% some other things. But pretty much, we want to be rich. We want to be a winner. We want the, you know, the gold medal, the blue ribbon, checkered flag. We want, we want to be a winner. We want to be powerful, but not just powerful. We want everybody to like us while we do it. We want to be popular too. But at the end of his life, Jesus was none of those things. Think about it. At the end of his life, the end of his life, is Jesus rich? No. No, he's not rich. Is Jesus a winner? No. Pilate won. Caiaphas won. Herod won. Jesus loses. He's not a winner. Is he powerful? I know. Everything in you wants to say, he's powerful, he's God, he's powerful, he's powerful. I'm just just looking at what happens. He is the picture of powerlessness. He's naked, nailed to a tree, and he dies. What we would call, bear with me now, a very pathetic death. And is he popular? No. No. He's not pop- he, he had his moment of popularity about a year and a half earlier. He's not popular now. The whole city turned against him. His disciples can't be found. They're either betraying him, denying him, or hiding. He's not popular. This is a scandal. This is a scandal. You know what a scandal is? A scandal is is an offense. It's a, it's, a, it's a stumbling block. It's a thing that'll mess us up. It's a thing that, that offends us. Be careful or you get offended at this sermon, but, but don't be. Because the sermon can save your soul. Well, Jesus can save your soul, but I'm, I'm, the sermon can show you how to approach that. But despite all of this, All kinds of preachers, sermons, books, DVDs, conferences use the Bible to show us how to succeed. If you you disagree with me, you you, you take remote in hand and go through a stroll through TV Christian land. They're they're 24 7 channels, so you can do it anytime, day or night. And just just stroll, just just hit, there's about, I don't know how many of them there are, there's like seven or eight of those channels. Just hit one and see how long it is before they're talking about conventional aspects of success that you can become rich you'll be a winner you'll be powerful you'll be popular and then as soon as you say okay that's what they're on to then click the next one and you'll go through all of them in about two minutes because that's what they all talk about because there's a brisk market in it but they all ignore the stubborn fact that the bible actually tells a very different story I mean, if you, if you didn't actually read the book yourself, but you were just, you know, some stranger, just some, some unchurched person, and you're just taking their word for it, you'd think this Bible is kind of, it's about how to be a success in life. Although it actually tells a very different story. The Bible says you have to win by losing. The Bible says you have to, to live, you have to die. The Bible says you, to succeed, you have to fail. That the way up is down. So I know, you're sitting here thinking, you're saying, so are you saying that I have to orchestrate my own failure? Oh no, oh no, not at all. Of course not, absolutely not. Put that thought out of your mind. Life itself will take care of that for you, my friend. No, no, the last thing, no, no, do not, do not, repeat, do not go out and try to orchestrate your own failure. Don't worry, it'll come. In its own good time, it'll come. But when it does come, what I'm saying is, don't fight it as much as you might. Maybe you'll call to mind, wait a minute, there was that, so-called, in the moment, apparent failure of Jesus. Except it wasn't. 
The early church had a song they liked to sing, and the lyrics go like this. Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. So he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. And being found in the likeness of a man, he humbled himself to obedience, even obedience to death, even death upon a cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him. And given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that little song that they sang that Paul puts in his letter to the Philippians, that song is telling you the way up is down. The way you win is to lose. The way to true success is going to be along the road of failure at times. Because although he is God, he doesn't regard equality with, equality with God. I think they be grasped, but he empties himself. Kenosis, he empties himself. He pours himself out. So I, I emptied myself of my rights. I got my rights. Jesus, I got the right to be God, and I'm going to empty that run out. That's a pretty, that's a pretty precious right to let go of. I have the right to be God, and I let it go. And he humbled himself, and he became like a slave, it actually says, a doulos. And he was obedient, because that's what God calls us to, faithfulness, not success. Faithfulness. And he was obedient unto death, even death upon a cross, the most shameful of all deaths. And because of that, God intervenes and exalts him. And gives him the name above every name. Hallelujah. One of the main lessons you are to learn from that effective teacher, very effective teacher. She's a bit stern. Anybody ever have a stern teacher growing up in school? We have a stern teacher called failure. And one of the main lessons you are to learn from that very effective, though occasionally very stern teacher called failure is to stop living an agenda-driven life. I know that that sounds like heresy to American ears. Stop living an agenda-driven life. Learn to pray. Learn to pray. I can teach you how to pray. And the first thing we're going to learn in prayer is to let go of agenda because the primary purpose of prayer is not to get God to do what you want God to do, which is make you a success, but to be properly formed. Learn to abandon outcomes. Obsession with outcomes is a a trap. Stop trying to control everything in your life and learn to live life. You you can do one or two things, but you can't do them at the same time. You can try to control life or you can live life, but you can't do them at the same time. If you're trying to control life, you're not living. You're not. You're not. You're not. Uh, you're not living in the moment. You're. You're trying. You're. You're conniving. You're scheming. You're trying to control it, which means control other people. Because that's the only way you can control life is to control other people. And when you are controlling life, you're not living life. Learn to trust God. I know. I don't know how to say it. It sounds like a cliche, doesn't it? It's what we teach. It's what we teach them in Sunday school. I mean, it's in children's churches, it's what we teach them when they're kindergartens. It's what we teach them when they're two years old. Trust God. But I don't think we ever get much beyond that. Trust God. Don't be afraid. Trust God. Learn that to experience failure is not to be a failure. Learn that God does not call us to be successful but faithful. Learn that even when you feel like God has forsaken you, God has not forsaken you. Learn that you can always put your failure in God's hands. You can just, you can gather it all up and say, well, it's in your hands now. Learn that this is what Jesus did when he died on the cross as the crucified God. There's There's a reason why we need the wisdom of elders. 
It's because most of what we really need to learn the most, we don't learn in the first part of life. Well, I mean, in the first part of life, we learn to win. You know, you can't preach everything in one sermon. It'd be a really long sermon anyway. So you add the grains of salt to this sermon that you think it needs. Some of you are going to put a lot of salt on it. I need a whole bunch of salt. That's fine. I understand. You can add the salt. The grains of salt you can add. Add it with a grain of salt. I get that. But how many of you also know you're hearing some true things? Yes, we need to learn. There, there's, there's things to learn in the first half of life about just, you know, how things work and how you do things. And, and yes, you, I don't know how else to say it. You learn how to succeed and win in the first part of life. And that's part of it. It can't be avoided. It shouldn't be avoided. But we also have to learn how to lose and that's even more important. When I was 27, God said, preach faith and your church will grow. And I did and it did. Because he did. I mean, it was all like that. God said it, and I acted upon it, and what he said would happen did happen. When I was 45, God started talking to me about other stuff. Cross, mystery, eclectic, community, revolution. Same voice. And that led to some loss. And truth. And wisdom. Today, if I can't do anything else, I can teach people how to pray. And by the way, I believe in resurrection. Let's pray. Why don't you stand up with me? I don't want to be too much into Easter yet. We're still in Lent. We're still more than a week away from Easter. There'll be plenty of time to preach resurrection. I believe in it. I just said that. But there's lessons to be learned on Good Friday. So Jesus, we pray to you. The crucified God. The one who apparently, even after your resurrection, you bore the marks of crucifixion in your hands, in your feet, and in your side. Because there are some things that are never to be forgotten. Jesus, you drank a bitter cup. A bitter cup that you did not want to drink. You told your father as much that you didn't want to drink it. You said, I don't want to drink this. There's got to be some other way. Take it away. Let it pass from me. There's got to be a different way. You, Jesus, you did not want to go the way of failure, the way of loss, the way of suffering, the way of pain, the way of sorrow, the way of death. You didn't want to drink that bitter cup. Jesus, we all know about that. Because we don't want to drink, we don't want to drink it either. But the thing is, Jesus, you did drink it. When it came right down to the crucial moment, the crucial, the the cruc, the crucible moment, the crux moment, the cross moment, you didn't run away from it. You didn't bail out. You were faithful, even though everybody else thought you were failing. You were not failing. You were faithful. But we are so, we are so messed up as a species, as humans. We are so upside down in our systems.
that was that what was in fact the greatest act of obedience in all of history from our vantage point all messed up as we are it looks like failure to us and so you had to go it alone but you did and you trusted everything to the hands of your father and he did not abandon your soul to shield he did not allow you to suffer corruption but on the third day raised you from the dead and then exalted you to his right hand and Jesus you are Lord but you're also our high priest and we're told that you are easily moved by our feelings that you're not a high priest who cannot sympathize but you are in fact just the opposite you are very sympathetic you know what it's like to feel like a failure you know what it's like to feel alone you know what it's like to feel like it's all spinning out of control you even know what it's like to feel like you've been even forsaken by God, even though you weren't. And so, Lord, come to those of us who may be feeling some of those things. Oh, Jesus, we never felt it like you. We know that. We're not going to compare with what we go to with what you went through. We know that. We're just saying we know you can sympathize and that you care and that you love that you're merciful that you are a merciful and sympathetic high priest easily, to easily touched with the feelings of our weaknesses our infirmities so touch us Jesus even in the gar garden of Gethsemane an angel came and touched you send the angels when we need them most angels from heaven Sometimes it's, sometimes it's angels appearing as people and sometimes it's people appearing as angels. We don't care which way it is. Just send us the help we need when we need it. And help us to, to follow you in that way of death and burial where we say, God, I place it in your hands, believing all along that there is resurrection. And that what needs to be raised will be raised. And what isn't raised needed to stay dead anyhow. But that if we trust you in the end, we're not going to be disappointed. Lord, I want to say that to these people. I say this to, I say this, to this congregation. Trust in God and you won't be disappointed. You may, you'll, have some, you'll have some nights and, of sorrow. You'll have some periods of pain. You'll have some good Fridays. You'll have some Gethsemanes. But you won't be long disappointed. God will not allow you to long be disappointed. Trust in God and you won't be disappointed. He will prove himself faithful to you. Just trust in him. It's not a formula. It's not working up faith, as it were. It's not trying hard. I mean, when Jesus is on the cross and in his dying breath, he's saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He's not trying hard. I mean, he's not trying anymore. No, there's nothing to try. He just says, Father, it's in your hands now. And that was enough. That's all he needed to do. And it's all you need to do. See, we call it success. When we complete the project, of making, the, making life the way we want life to be. But you understand what that is? That's trying to be God is what that is. That's trying to be God. So don't try to be God. Just trust God. You just be you. You just be a human. You just live, breathe, be in the moment, love, and trust God. And let God be God. God's plenty good at being God. The reason we try so hard, we... We try to make our life the way we want our life to be, which involves control and trying to control others, is that we don't have any faith. We don't, we're, we're practical atheists. We don't think God, either we don't think God exists or we think God doesn't care. 
Well, God does exist and God does care and you can trust him. So just lift your hands with me and just say, say it in your own words, but say something to the effect. I mean, think about the things that are troubling you and bothering you right now, the things that you're anxious and worried about, the things that you'd like to jump in and control if you could and just say, Father, I put it in your hands. God, I trust you. I put it in your hands. I don't know what else to do. I put it in your hands. And if it and I die, well then God, you raise up what you want to raise up. But I trust you, God. I trust you. I trust you. And as you place this in God's hand, here's what comes to you. Peace. Breathe it in right now. Just breathe in peace. Take a deep breath and just receive the peace of Christ that passes understanding. Receive peace. Everything's going to be all right. God causes all things to work together to good those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Just breathe in peace and trust God and know everything's going to be all right. Amen. And amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Isn't Jesus the best? Hooray for Jesus. <laughs> Three cheers for Jesus. He's the best. He did it. And he's going to help us to do it. Amen. I got one more crucified God sermon for Sunday morning.